Thank you very much and welcome to this webinar and thank you for joining us. I have spent the last 10 years researching the subject of charismatic leadership and especially the Madiba codes. And I'd like to give you a little bit of background on myself. You can probably hear from my accent. I was born and bred in Germany and uh, I did my PhD in history on the Roman Emperor Nero at the University of Berlin and then in late 93 came down to the University of KZN in Durban and moved up to Johannesburg and my co-founder Herman spent three years in the United States doing case studies on leadership and innovation and then we, when he came back ten years ago we started the company and my focus, my mission, my work really focuses on motivational intelligence and that is to figure out what motivates a human being to take action, specifically what motivates employees to come up with new ideas and to be, be innovative. Uh, a book that was um, reviewed by former President Mobeki. Um, what motivates brands to become a market leader in your industry? Um, and how can you use the concept of motivational intelligence in engaging your customers and turning your customers to brand advocates? Um, then also movement marketing, how to motivate a constituency, a nation um, to vote for you. I did the brand ambassador program for 2010, the World Cup in South Africa and subsequently the one in Brazil 2014. Now let me ask you a question that is at the very heart of charismatic leadership and that is what you like to become significantly more productive and effective. Would you like to be more successful in all aspects of your life? And finally, would you like to dramatically improve the results you get from the people who work with you? Now this is really what Charisma is all about and I'm going to show you and tell you just now um, where Charisma, the concept of charismatic leadership comes from. But in a nutshell, it means that every time you interact with somebody whether that person walks away from you feeling better or worse. And if you think about it for a moment, if everybody you interact with somebody at work, at home, um, if that person walks away feeling better, obviously they will be more inclined to follow your leadership. And that's why charismatic leadership is really the key to success. And studies have shown that it is a missing link to employee engagement. Now, according to a global workforce study, by Thomas Perrine that analyzed and surveyed 90,000 employees in 18 countries, companies with a high employee engagement have a 19% increase in operating and 28% increase in earnings per share. Um, companies on the other side of the spectrum with low employee engagement have uh, a drop of 32% in operating income and the EPS declines 11%. Now, without boring you with the numbers, that basically means that there is a difference of 52% in a one-year performance between companies with a high employee engagement and those with low employee engagement. Now, studies have also shown that employee disengagement is a massive problem in the global workforce. And we know that in the US alone, 17% of the workforce are positively disengaged, 54% are not engaged, and only 29% are really engaged. And the cost of disengagement, and again, these are figures from the US, is in the region of 250 to 350 billion dollars a year. So significant cost. Now, the link between charismatic leadership and employee engagement really occurs across two of these three interconnected relationships in the workplace. Um, first, the relationship between employees and management. Secondly, between employees and their jobs. And thirdly, between employees and other employees. And clearly you can see already that leaders have a major role to play in the first and the second dimension of workforce relationships. And that's why charismatic leadership is so important and this is the effect it can have when exercised positively. Now, why are we talking about charismatic leadership? What charismatic leaders really achieve is, in a nutshell, they create and maintain a work environment where people are emotionally and intellectually committed. And this is really the key word, they are not just engaged, 
they are committed to the organization, organization's goals. Um, also, charismatic leaders build an energetic and positive attitude in others and inspire them to do their very best. And finally, charismatic leaders create a common sense of purpose, where people are more inclined to invest extra energy and some of their own time in their work. So clearly it has a major role and impact on the performance of the organization. And when it comes to charisma and the concept of charisma, there's a myth that we need to deal with because many people believe that charisma is a God-given gift, that you have it or you don't. And that is not the case at all. In fact, um, Arthur Clark said, as you can see here, that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Now, it is clearly a human tendency to describe anything we don't fully understand in magical terms. However, charisma is understandable, and charisma can be defined, and it's derived from the Greek charisma, which means a gift of grace, a favor freely given. And it actually was coined to um, denote the characteristics of, in Greek mythology, of the goddesses of charm, beauty, and uh, human creativity. And it's defined by the dictionary as a special quality of leadership that captures a popular imagination and inspires allegiance and devotion. Now, that's why the media like to refer to charisma as the X factor. And charisma really helps you, and anybody at, in the workplace, uh, helps you to get your ideas adopted faster, to get your implement, projects implemented easier. Um, it helps you tremendously when you're applying for a job. Um, it helps you to receive higher, better performance ratings. And it generally helps you to be viewed as more attractive and desirable. Now, the big question is obviously, are charismatic leaders born or made? And I have given it away already. And Warren Bennis really um, dispelled the charisma myth when he said the most dangerous leadership myth asserts that people simply either have certain charismatic qualities or not. And that is clearly not the case. Leaders, charismatic leaders are made rather than born. And you would see that with business leaders like Steve Jobs um, that have acquired these skills of charismatic leaderships. They were not born with these skills. And therefore, charisma is not the quality that you possess or not. Charisma is really a perception it is based on the interaction you have with another person, and that's why nobody can be charismatic on your own. And it really is like beauty. It is charisma is in the eye of the beholder. And it is based and really depends on the behaviors and the situational context you're in. So in other words, charisma, um, you could, when addressing an audience, a crowd of people, you could um, come across as charismatic, yet in a one-to-one -one situation, you could be uncharismatic. Um, it depends on the context and your behaviors and the perception of the other person. Now, Madiba um, acquired these skills of charismatic leadership, and he put them to good use, and they are learnable. And today what I will do, I will share with you the 10 steps to charismatic leadership. I will focus on the first five. Um, I will give you tools to acquire these skills, to master these skills, to practice these skills. And uh, as you can see, they are in sequence, and I will unpack them in the sequence from one to ten. Now, the first charismatic skill has everything to do with the so-called archetypes. These are the ultimate personality types that Professor Carl Jung more than 100 years ago uh, deciphered, and they apply it to leadership. Now, the archetype of the personality type of Nelson Mandela became apparent when he grew up in the little village of Mveso in the eastern Transkei, and he, like all the other boys, started stick fighting. He excelled in stick fighting, 
And uh, his name, interestingly, gives us a good indication of his leadership or personality at that time, because Rory Klafla, this epic name, means the troublemaker, the one who shakes the tree. And this name became prophetic, as we now know, um, Rory Klafla, the troublemaker. And it also indicated uh, his personality type at the early stage of his life. Now, he also learned while he was growing up in the Eastern Transkei, he learned from the elders, he listened to the tales of African warriors like Shaka Zulu, and he was influenced by these um, inspiring stories. And we know that he won then later when he went to university to Fort Hare, he was expelled from the student council because he took a principled decision on a matter that he regarded as unfair. Um, and then finally, one more um, incident that shed light on his character, on his personality, on his archetype at that time, time was in 1952 at the 300-year, the 3-centenary celebration of um, Jan van Rebeck coming to the Cape, coming to South Africa, and the ANC, uh, Mandela's party, um, had a, an event um, on the same day at which he, and he was just a, a very ordinary party member, he prophesied that he would become president one day. Now that was unheard of in view of the elders, in view of um, the president of the ANC, um, yet he made a prophecy 50 years before it became true. Um, and then finally, he expressed this, this early archetype at an event with um, Daram Yusuf um, in the late, in, sorry, in the mid 50s, 1950s, um, in a campaign, um, in a mobilization campaign, when he disagreed vehemently with the points the speaker made. And we now know from uh, Amalia Kasharia that he pushed him away from the stage. So, all these incidents are clearly indicating that at this early stage, his archetype, the archetype of Nelson Mandela, was the warrior. Now, here's the definition of the warrior. The warrior, at your best, you show what it means to have real courage and de determination, the kind that allows the hero to face uh, an antagonist, um, and you enjoy competing and spearheading a crusade. At the same time, the warrior archetype is at its best when you are on a mission. And the warrior archetype has a code of honor that requires a high level of discipline and a strong sense of pride. And finally, the warrior archetype tends to notice injustice, challenges, and antagonists. Now, interestingly, um, Mandela deliberately transformed his archetype, his leadership archetype, and he later confided to his good friend Bill Clinton that it took him 11 years on Robben Island um, to transform his archetype. And there are certain incidents that give us a good idea, a good notion of what his later archetype was all about. And one such incident is reported by his lawyer, George Bezos, who was visiting Mandela in the early days on Robben Island and was astounded to find that Mandela walked with dignity when he met him, and he introduced the eight prison wardens that took him to the visitor's room one by one to George Bezos. So he paid respect forward, and that's why the wardens at Robben Island always respected um, Mandela. He also later on, when he revisited Robben Island, he admitted that he underwent um, a change, he, uh, a personal transformation, and that he had been unkind to the people before he went to Robben Island, unkind to the people that treated him well in Johannesburg uh, when he was struggling, um, looking for work, and looking for his place in life. And he did admit that um, we also now know that um, when Bill Clinton later on, on the eve of uh, Mandela's passing in 2013, he 
pointed to that Mandela was aware of a higher reality, that he had a certain gift, a very uncommon gift, and that is to see the humanity in everybody. And he became the archetype, he adopted the archetype of the magician. Now here's the definition of the magician archetype, which is the highest archetype in leadership, it's the highest archetype in consciousness, and the magician archetype is all about being transformative, charismatic, and having a healing presence. The, the magician knows how to unite people behind a common vision and makes that vision a reality, and understands that the structures of consciousness govern what happens in life. Now, this is the exact definition of the magician archetype, um, and as you can see, Nelson Mandela's later personality um, and actions fit this archetype hand in glove. As a leader, you are visionary who energizes others by inspiring them, inspiring them to be true to their deeper values and work together to make a transformative dream come true. Um, now, it is very important that you identify, and interestingly, here we see Mandela at a meeting with former president P.W. Bota, who had a very different archetype, and this was his um, famous gesture um, pointing out, and he was called the crocodile, the great crocodile, and his Bota's archetype was clearly the ruler. Um, now, it is very important that you figure out if and when you want to become a master charismatic leadership, you figure out your archetype. There's 12 archetypes, and I'm quickly going to run through them. The first is the innocence. Now, all these archetypes are basically about how you, do you see life. If you see life as a promised land, um, where life is perfect, if you have this trusting inner child, then uh, you are the inno innocent, and your motto is really to be free, to be you and me. The core paradise is to get the story, core desire is to get the paradise, and your strategy is to do things right. So, very much like the Dalai Lama. Um, if you are the regular archetype, you believe that everybody is created equal, um, you have a strong desire to connect with others, and you certainly do not want to stand out from the crowd. Um, and very much like Tom Hanks in Forum Gum, if you have seen that movie, you are very much down to earth. The regular guy archetype. Um, however, the warrior archetype, we discussed this briefly, very much like Donald Trump, if you believe that life is all about competition, it is about proving yourself, achieving goals, overcoming obstacles, and if you believe that when there's a will, there's a way, you are the warrior archetype. Um, another very strong archetype is very much like Mother Teresa, the caregiver archetype. If you are very altruistic, if you deeply care about others, if you believe your life's purpose is to help others to contribute, then you are the caregiver and the caregiver believes in principles such as love your neighbor as yourself, um, the desire is to care and protect for others, and the strategy is doing things for others. Now you can obviously see that archetypes can move over the line. They can, it is called the shadow archetype, if you become too much of a caregiver, you can end up being a martyr. So there's always a balance. If you are like uh, Richard Branson, and you love exploring, you love traveling, uh, you love discovering, um, then you are the explorer. And the explorer's motto is don't fence me in. This is an archetype that does not take easily to commitments. It's an archetype that wants to discover themselves, yourself, and the world, inner discovery and outer discovery. And it's constantly seeking out and experiencing new things, the explorer archetype. The outer archetype. Now, this is a strong archetype. It is obviously not a, always a very positive archetype, but it's an archetype that we've seen time and again, for example, James Dean in the movie Rebel with a Course. And the outer archetype is all about um, breaking rules. It is about the belief that rules are there, are made to be broken. The core desire is the revenge, and the strategy is to disrupt. Um, 
destroyer. The lava archetype, very much like Liz Taylor, governs all kinds of love, from parental love to romantic love. Um, and uh, if you have the need to connect deeply with others, intimately with others, um, then you are the lover archetype. The creator archetype, very much like, much like Mark Shuttleworth, the creator of VeriSign and the software, if you are very creative, if you have a need to, or if you always come up with new ideas, um, then you are the creator. And uh, you can see already, obviously, that this archetype can become a perfectionist. So again, you need to strike the balance. The ruler archetype, we touched on that before. The ruler archetype is all about taking responsibility for your life, uh, exercising control, um, and uh, ultimately being in charge. The magician archetype, you've seen that. That is the highest archetype in terms of consciousness. It is the archetype where you are able to influence others, where you are able to turn visions into realities, where you are able to transform um, society, very much like Mandela did. Um, and it requires a deep understanding of the fundamental laws of the universe. And it obviously the strategy is to develop a vision and to communicate this vision and to live by it. Then second, last, is the sage archetype. Um, if you have a great need to understand um, the truth, um, then very much like Albert Einstein, you are the sage. Um, the truth will set you free. That is really your motto. You seek out you know, information, uh, analysis, and knowledge. And you can already see that these archetypes apply to organizational brands as well as to individuals. So obviously the sage archetype applies to many, of the, uh, many universities, many institutions of learning. For example, Harvard, Princeton, they obviously have adopted, even CNN many times adopted, the sage archetype as a brand um, personality. And the last archetype is really the jester archetype. If you believe life should be about fun, if you like to be the funny guy like uh, Art Big Job, uh, Desmond Tutu, then you are the jester, um, you live in the moment, and you love to be playful. Now, um, the three questions you really need to ask yourself are, when, when it comes to discovering, mastering your archetype, uh, step number one of charismatic leadership, first, which archetype are you currently living? And it's really the story that you're telling yourself and others. Is that the story of the explorer? Is that the story of the ruler? Is it the story of the sage? Is it the story of the um, magician? And which archetype are you aspiring to live? Which story do you want to live in future? Now, this is very important for your leadership role to really sit down and think hard about which archetype do you want to become in future? And for which archetype do you want to be known? And then finally, how can you communicate your new archetype? What do you have to do or what do you have to change to be true to your new archetype? Now, um, this affects many aspects of um, communication. For example, if you think, um, for example, the archetypal explorer Richard Branson, you hardly see him wear a suit and tie. So, um, because he is the explorer. And um, if you're the explorer, you would probably want to drive a certain brand of car. You would probably want to rather drive a Land Rover or a Jeep rather than a Mercedes. Um, so it affects many facets of your leadership style. And if you wish to, and even movies have been, in fact, Star Wars, um, the enduring success of Star Wars is to a large extent based on using these archetypes these archetypal characters, and you find the same in the Matrix and Harry Potter. Um, now, if you wish to figure out your archetype, please go to the website, themydivaco.com. You'll see on the top, discover your archetype. It will take you to a course on archetypal branding, um, where you will be able to analyze your personal archetype, 
and your organizational archetype. So that is step number one, archetypal branding. Step number two is understanding and declaring your mission. Now, charismatic leaders always have a strong mission, and they're always brilliant at communicating and declaring their mission for a better world. Now, very much with uh, Mandela, his mission, which was based on fairness and equality, um, he communicated early on, as I mentioned, at the University of Fort Hare, where he actually resigned from the student council over a matter uh, that he believed was dealt unfairly. Um, and then later on, these became the most famous words of the 20th century, which he actually said at his trial in 1964. It um, was his final submission. And I quote, I fought against black domination and I fought against white domination. I have cherished the ideal of a democratic and free society in which all persons live together in harmony and with equal opportunities. It is an ideal which I hope to live for and to achieve, but if needs be, it's an ideal for which I'm prepared to die. Now, these, are, these have become the most famous words of the 20th century because ultimately it's a mission that everybody shares. We all want to live together in harmony and with equal opportunities. Um, and that's why they resonated for so long. And they still do resonate. So the question you need to ask yourself is, what is your leadership mission? What is the difference you want to make in the world? Um, what is your message? Very, very important. You need to coin a message. And many times you can actually decipher your message when you look at what excites you the most in the world and what angers you the most. Um, and then thirdly, what you need to um, ask yourself, what is it you want to hear on your 100th birthday? And I'm asking this question because my grandmother lived until 101. And the things people said about her, herself and her life on a 100th birthday were remarkable. And uh, so if you come to celebrate and see your centenary, what is it that, what is your legacy? What is it that you would want people to say? So your mission, your message, and the legacy, these are very profound questions. These are questions that you will probably take time to find the answer. But for your charismatic leadership persona, these are really, really important uh, questions. The third step to charismatic leadership is about engaging your mentor. Now, the mentor in Mandela's um, life played a major role. In fact, it was the mentor uh, who was Walter Sassoulou, an advocate that um, Mandela met early on in his life when he came to Johannesburg, when he was in search of work, when he then uh, got a job as a legal clerk, thanks to Walter Sassoulou. And Walter Sassoulou took him, this farm boy, under his wing, and he educated him, and he groomed him, um, and he turned him, he was instrumental, Sassoulou was instrumental in turning Mandela into uh, the leader, the leader of a mass movement he was about to become. Now, we know from interviews with Walter Sassoulou that there was something particular that he saw in Mandela the first time he met him. We know that there were certain elements that impressed him which was his demeanor. He actually called it Mandela's demeanor, um, Mandela's way of speaking. Um, and he saw the potential uh, for leadership. And this is really what Sisulu then communicated to Mandela, um, not so much in spoken words, but subconsciously. He treated him like a potential leader, like the leader he could become. And this changed. Mandela's outlook on life, it changed Mandela's, we know he later said it set him on fire, he now was prepared to um, endure sacrifices for the leadership role that he took. He now had a higher vision and he wanted to live up to the expectation Susulu was holding of him. Now this is a very, very important quality and skill in leadership, it's called the law of expectation, and uh, the law of expectation 
goes back to a Greek goddess um, called Galatea, sorry, a Greek um, sculptor called Pygmalion. Pygmalion um, was in search of the perfect woman. He couldn't find her, so he sculpted her, and then he prayed to the goddess of uh, love, Aphrodite, to bring her to life. Aphrodite did bring her to life, and they got married and lived happily thereafter. And that exemplifies the law of expectation. If you expect somebody to do well, they will. Nine out of ten times they will prove you right. Um, it's even um, been demonstrated in this experiment um, with a horse, horse called Clever Hans in Germany a hundred years ago. The instructor, Herr Pfungst, would tap certain numbers and then the horse, Clever Hans, was able to subtract or multiply or add. Let's say Herr Pfungst uh, tapped two plus two and then the horse would tap four times. Um, now, obviously, the horse was not able to do calculus, but the horse picked up the expectation from the instructor. When he tapped the correct number of times, let's say four times, he picked up from the slight behavior, the slight change in posture, um, and the flaring of the nostrils of the instructor. He picked up that this was the uh, correct answer. We've seen the law of expectation also in schools, where they divided the classroom into two um, with the same kind of students, um, but they told the teacher that this group of students were highly talented and the other group of students were below average. And this, the teacher, without ever saying a word, would treat the supposedly highly talented students differently from um, the below average and it showed in the performance. The supposedly highly talented students outperformed every single time um, their classmates. Now, in engaging your mentor, there's really three questions you need to consider, and I want to make this practical. So, who is your mentor? If you don't have a mentor, please go and seek out a mentor. This is really important. Um, no matter what your stage in life, what your position in life, what your position in business, um, you must always have a mentor that can many times not just give us a hand up, but also a different perspective. Many times a mentor enables us to see things differently, to have a bigger, better perspective. What is it that you can learn and what is it that you did learn from your mentor? Secondly, equally important, who are you mentoring? What is your mentee learning from you? And um, this is really important. Um, the ability to mentor somebody else, to pass on your skills. And you will see that it is called it's called the law of life, the hero's journey. True champions do, and true leaders do pass on um, their skills and they do mentor others. And ultimately, ask yourself this question. When in your life did you apply the law of expectation? And what happened? When did you expect somebody to really do well and did that person prove you right? So that's step number three, the third secret of charismatic leadership to engage your mentor. The fourth step is all about commanding authority, and that is today it's called thought leadership. And thought leadership and authority is something that Mandela adopted and practiced early on. Uh, here we see him, and what he did is really he took the struggle in South Africa to a different level. Um, prior to Mandela becoming a leader in the movement, the struggle was very passive. Um, he turned it into what is today is called movement marketing, and that meant to get people become active. For example, he, he over here we can see him burning the um, passports. Um, that was an action that was replicated thousands of times across the country. So movement marketing, Mandela really was the father of movement marketing in South Africa, and he became an authority and a thought leader on movement marketing. Even in retirement, we now know, and he testified to it, 
after he retired, world leaders were still calling on him. Now this is almost unheard of because when a president retires, typically they go on tour, they write a book, and they go in, into obscurity, but they are not typically solicited for advice from world leaders. Now the reason why the reason why world leaders still were turning to Mandela for advice was he had some very uh, precious knowledge and wisdom that every leader today needs and that is about nation building and uniting people behind the vision. Something he had been doing very successfully um, in terms of reconciling South African society, uniting South African society behind the common vision and creating a new society and that's really nation building uh, one of his greatest legacies. Um, then also commanding authority, becoming a thought leader, um, while he was hiding from the authorities, um, he was staying at the house of Wolfi Kodesh, a journalist, and for a number of weeks, and Wolfi Kodesh later told us that Mandela at that stage um, was about to become the commander of the armed forces of the ANC. And he had obviously never been to an army, he didn't have military training, a little bit on his uh, journey throughout Africa, but he needed to become an authority on um, military resistance. And he did that by reading a book, a book that Kodesh, Wolf Kodesh would recommend to him, would give to him while he was hiding out in the apartment. It was the work of Clausewitz on war. And not only did Mandela read it, but he studied it line by line, he underscored, he underlined, and he made it um, his own work. He mastered um, the subject that he was reading about. And as you know, leaders are readers. Um, that is a very, very critical skill for any leader, especially today, where times are changing so fast that you have to stay up to date, you have to read, you have to be online, you have to tap into different sources of learning. So my question to you is, what are your sources of learning? Which books are you reading currently? And you should really be reading at least one book a week. Um, in which area do you want to become a thought leader? Today it is easier than ever before to become a thought leader because we have the publishing platforms, especially on LinkedIn, and I encourage you to master publishing on LinkedIn. If you wish, I can send you an ebook on that. Which subject do you want to master in 2016? Not 15, in 2016. And what are the steps that will take you to thought leadership? Um, in which, which are the goals you have to be achieved to become a thought leader in your area? Um, so that is a second, uh, sorry, this is um, the fourth element, commanding authority. And then, I know we're running out of time, but I need to touch on the last one, which is motivation and intelligence, because this is really important. For 27 years, Mandela and his colleagues were imprisoned in Robben Island. He mastered the art of motivating himself and others through a principle that I call motivation intelligence, which he first applied in the courtroom, where many years before um, blacks were allowed to even practice law, he was, he, he was extremely confident in the courtroom, even in many cases. And then on Robben Island, um, he mastered these seven factors of motivational intelligence, and I'm quickly going to run through them, um, because this was really the key to stay motivated on this uh, most atrocious prison in South Africa for 27 years. The first emotivator and motivational intelligence is different to emotional intelligence in that it allows you to proactively motivate yourself and others and not just react to a situation. The first one is the first one is assurance. We all have a need, a human being has a need for assurance, to be assured that you still have a job next year, that your company is still around. Um, now, assurance, interestingly, in Robben Island was based on the fact that they interpreted the prison term not as um, being shut out, but as a struggle on another level. 
and they never lost hope that there would be that their ideas would prevail. In fact, this is what Castrada said, the struggle on another terrain. They also uh, compared their fate to other prisoners who were fearing much worse, and they had confidence in these ideas as the Sulu said. Um, then a challenge, this was very interesting, we all have a need for challenge, we need to challenge ourselves, we need targets, we need goals, and a challenge that um, they took up is that they, they challenged um, the authorities, especially in the line quarry, where they had to, um, they took a stand for the meaningless work they had to conduct in the line quarry, and Mandela was the, the leader that set the pace, he didn't allow the water to set the pace, and this is what one of the school prisoners said, Neville Alexander, at the beginning it was really a war place between the waters, the authorities ourselves, it was a question of who was setting the pattern. Um, so I know we are almost out of time, if um, we can quickly confirm, do we still have five minutes? Hello? Uh Yes, Dr. Nicholas, you may take five minutes to sort of wrap it up. Okay, good. Let me wrap it up. Thank you very much. So um, the third motivator is the need to connect, and this is a need to connect with other human beings face-to-face -face and not just through mobile, but obviously this is a very strong e-motivator, and this is the one e-motivator that was absolutely instrumental to um, keep motivated on the islands because the authorities had uh, made, that was probably, according to Mandela, the biggest mistake in that they had kept the uh, 30 leaders together. Um, and uh, the fourth motivator is significance. We need to feel that what you do at work makes a difference, adds value. Um, and that was the case with Mandela on the island. Um, where he became a role model for other prisoners. He set the style of confidence and dignity. This is a poem that he kept reciting, the poem Invictus by W. E. Henley. Um, and then in the early 70s, um, something in uh, interesting was happening when young voters came to the island, and there was a real dialogue between the voters and the prisoners, and the prisoners started to educate the voters. Um, then growth, growth, we all need to grow, and if you don't grow, you many times this is the main reason why people leave an organization when they hit the ceiling, um, and growth was um, possible, in fact, was a key factor in uh, Mandela's stay on Robben Island, and here we have a glimpse into a cell, many books, and in fact, um, they turned Robben Island into a university where they would, the prisoners would teach each other, each other, they created a culture of cooperation and learning, and they um, importantly um, made sure that everybody left with at least one degree. So it literally was uh, the atmosphere of a university. Second but the last is the need for contribution. We all have a need to contribute to the well-being of others, and you will find if you don't activate that need, that motivator in your life, many times you will feel empty. Now contribution, interestingly, and this is the only image we have of Mandela during his stay on Robben Island, um, working in the garden, he cultivated um, a garden on Robben Island, and according to Catrada, his fellow prisoner, um, this was really a baby, he was his baby, he was fanatical about it, he raised thousands of vegetables um, and contributed to the well-being of his other prisoners and other people on the island. Um, and even did that later on when he had left, when he was transferred from Robben Island to Portsmore. Um, so that was his activity of contribution. And finally, higher association. We all have a need for higher meaning for purpose in life and at work. And higher association, interestingly, on Robben Island came through the works of Shakespeare that was smuggled into the prison in this cover, an Indian uh, cover, and was read by the prisoners, and the prisoners then selected each um, a, a, um, a paragraph from the works of um, Shakespeare that gave them inspiration, and also the songs 
they were singing and gave some inspiration and higher association. So um, just three questions. What is important within these seven motivators is, um, and I'm going to give you access to a self-assessment, what are your primary motivators in your life? Is it the need to grow? Is it the need to contribute? Is it the need for significance? So you need to um, analyze your primary motivator, your secondary motivator, and then very, very importantly, to stay motivated at work and in life, you have to analyze which of your motivators are underserved and how can you close the gap in motivational intelligence. So this is how I would like to wrap up the first five secrets of charismatic leadership, the Madiba codes, and the book is forthcoming, so you will soon have a chance to read about all ten secrets of charismatic leadership. But I think now is the time for questions, um, if you have any. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Nicholas, for a very interesting presentation. Uh, folks, we are now open for the question and answers. If you have any questions, you could either put it in the question box, chat box, or you could raise your hand. There's a hand icon available on the webinar console. If you click on it, uh, you can even talk with Dr. Nicholas. So let me go straight to the question box. We have the first question from Brother Abdul Salam. The question, or rather a comment is, I think the most important intelligence model the leaders should master is collaborative intelligence. Thinking with people who think differently and being masters in systems thinking. Any comments? Yes, that is absolutely important, especially in this economy, in today's economy, in the what is called the collaboration economy. Um, that is probably one of the biggest factors of your success um, in the global workforce, your ability to collaborate with others. And as you can see, this is exactly what Mandela did on Robben Island. He collaborated with his team, and uh, this is very, very important. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for the question. We have another one, a short one. How can I discover my leadership archetype? Um, you can, I will send you the link. There's an online assessment, a self-assessment to discover your person archetype and your organizational archetype. And what you will find many times, especially as a leader, it is very important to align your personal archetype to the organizational archetype. So if your organizational archetype, for example, is the explorer, um, and you have an archetype, a personal archetype, that is very different. Let's say your personal archetype is a warrior. You need to look at that, and then it's really a matter of aligning the organizational and the personal, personal archetype. OK, thank you very much. Uh, we have another one. How can we identify the gaps in our team's motivational intelligence? Okay, that's, that's a great question. I do have a self-assessment for that, so I will make it available. I think it's 25 questions that will allow you exactly to identify which are the gaps in the motivators in your team. Okay. <clears throat> Another one, how can I join the Madiba Code live seminars? The live seminars you'll be able to join um, online, again, there's a link, and um, they're currently hosted in Johannesburg and Cape Town, so I will make the link available. Okay, there's another one from Sister Sybil Sahin. The question is, you mentioned the importance of mentor. What about a coach? Well, many times a mentor is a coach, um, and it can be a formal relationship. Many times what you find with mentors is it's a more informal relationship where a mentor different to a coach gives you a different perspective. Obviously, a coach would be a formal relationship. A mentor gives you a different perspective and helps you to master a skill. The one. Uh... Does the leadership archetype also apply to my organizational brand? Absolutely. You find that the best friends do consciously and deliberately adopt an archetype 
Um, for example, Harley Davidson, which is obviously a very strong brand, has deliberately adopted the warrior archetype. In fact, you find that the best brands um, have total alignment between the founders archetype and the organization archetype. For example, Virgin. Um, Virgin, the Virgin brand is all about the explorer and so is Richard Branson, the archetypal explorer. Interestingly, um, with the example of Apple, you can, if you are serious about it, you can change your archetypal brand for the organization. Steve Jobs changed it three times from the outlaw, remember the 1984 ad where they took on IBM directly, he changed the organization archetype from the outlaw to the think different to the magician. Um, hello. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, are you yeah. done? So it's, it's very, yes, if you can, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Please go ahead. Okay. Yeah. So it's, it's absolutely uh, important that you decipher the organization archetype and it's the best way to align your employees to the brand um, by getting them to understand what is the archetype of the brand and how can you best lift the brand, lift the archetype and communicate the archetype. Okay, last one quick question. Will the Mediba Code Seminar be available online? Yes, it will be available online and it will be available early in early March on Udemy, udemy.com. Okay, perfect. That really brings us towards the end of the webinar. Any concluding remarks, uh, Dr. Nicholas, before we dismiss out? Well, thank you very much. I'm very grateful I could be part of um, your series. It's the first time, and um, I hope um, that your attendees got value, and I would like to thank you very much, and uh, hope to, to see and get you and your delegates uh, again soon. Well, thank you very much, uh, and I really want to thank you on behalf of the Medina Institute for Leadership and Entrepreneurship, Mile for taking the time to deliver this live webinar through our platform. So once again, Dr. Neck.